the agent in option A committed an action as a consequence of a brain state, a brain state which evidently contains no freedom. In other words, the agent acted according to a brain state over which they exert no control. Now, if you want to define freedom as acting in accordance with one's own desires, then sure, agent A is free. But the problem is one's own desires are not things that agent A has chosen. We don't choose our own desires, as I pointed out earlier in the video. Our desires happen to us. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Thank you. Hello everybody, Magic Skeptic here, aka Magic Dara, and you're all most welcome to this very beard-heavy episode of A Magician's Thoughts. <laughs> I know to some of you people out there who have got really intense, proper, big Viking beards, this probably doesn't look like much. But admittedly, this is as long as I do like it to become. I feel, and I know it's a ridiculous comparison, but I feel like I'm starting to look a bit like Tom Hanks from Castaway. It's just a bit too wiry and a bit too long for my liking. <laughs> so if I look a bit unkempt compared to my usual standard aesthetic then I apologize. <laughs> I won't be uh, leaving it this way for long, I can assure you. But you know, therein resides the central hub of this conversation. Am I really responsible for allowing my beard to grow to this length? Is this down to my own subjective personal free will? Have I just neglected and am therefore responsible for allowing my beard to become wiry and longer than usual? That really is the question. Or is there any free will at all? Am I to blame for my beard being in this state? Now, this might seem like a strange introduction to a conversation about free will and determinism. But at the end of the day, if there is in fact no free will, then I'm not responsible for this. I'm not. I, I haven't chosen for this to happen, right? And so, yes, it starts with the minutia of whether or not a person shaves their beard, and it goes all the way up to including some of the most vicious and heinous acts that have been ever committed by humanity, whether it be Stalin's Gulag, Hitler's Holocaust, or Maoist China, right? Were those men really and truly responsible for what they did? Did they freely choose? Did they choose, according to some libertarian standard of free will, to commit those heinous, abhorrent, and unspeakable acts of brutality? Well, if you're interested in that question, then this is going to be the episode for you. And so, let's dive right in. What is determinism, guys? Determinism is the view that I, in fact, hold, and I would argue I have no choice but to hold it. It is the idea that there is no free will. Now, if you are sitting there and you're a believer in free will, please don't turn away just yet. And that might sound like a strange sentence. You might be thinking, oh, but Magic Skeptic, when you ask us to not turn away or when you ask us not to switch to another YouTube channel at this point in time, aren't you appealing to our free will? Not exactly. You see, guys, I'm not convinced there's any free will. I'm not convinced there's any at all. And when I ask you not to switch channels right now and not to go watch cat videos or whatever the hell else you watch on YouTube, when I ask you that, I don't ask you that with the assumption that you're free to choose. I say that because I hope, in my deterministic worldview, that the domino that is me asking, initiates a chain of causation in your mind, over which you exert no control, by the way. But I hope that me asking that exerts a domino effect in your mind that leads to you remaining here watching this video. And you might just push it back one step and say, oh, but Magic Skeptic, when you came up with that sentence, didn't that come from your free will? Didn't you choose to say those words? And again, I would say no. I don't know how I'm getting to the end of this sentence. Have you ever reflected consciously while talking? You're not reading from a script. The words are just happening. And it feels like you're merely experiencing them. But look, that's a bit vague. That's a bit abstract. That's not going to convince you that determinism is true, i.e. the idea that there's no free will if you weren't convinced already. So let's start with the basics here before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video. And let's just very quickly define what determinism is and explain what I perceive to be the strongest evidence for it.
Let's dive right in. So the first thing to be aware of is that determinism, definitionally speaking, is the absence of free will, that we do not make free choices. Whether or not I've left my beard grow or whether or not Hitler commits the Holocaust is all down to factors external to the agent themselves. An agent, of course, in this conversation is a reference to a conscious individual, a person with a brain that has thought and can commit actions. It doesn't mean, however, that those actions are freely chosen by the agent. Determinism, guys, is the idea that agent causation has not been substantiated, it has not been proven. In other words, the idea that an agent can be the initiator of a chain of causation. You see, in my view as a determinist, agents are not the causes of actions. They are merely the consequence of what has happened beforehand. So let's just jump into the evidence here, okay? Why do I believe that every sentence coming out of my mouth right now, or every supposed choice or decision I've made in my life, was unfree? Well, guys, if you boil it down to the mere facts of biology and physics... Each and every decision, each and every thought that has ever occurred in your mind has occurred as a consequence of a brain state, or at least that's the, what the evidence suggests. I'm going to table for a moment conversations and discussions about the soul. I'm not convinced there's any existence of a soul or anything like that. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts in depth on that, I did make a podcast on the soul, which you can check out. But for now, let's just assume some kind of a naturalistic framework where the brain is what the mind is, or at least the mind is an emergent property of the brain. That seems quite intuitively true. When people are in car crashes and have accidents and certain portions or quadrants of the brain are damaged, that is reliably correlated with various maladies of the brain. For example, the visual cortex at the back. If you get hit in the back of the head, you can become blind, right? People can lose their memories and we can reliably trace the part of the brain that is to do with memory. And sure enough, when a person loses their memory, we notice that that particular part of the brain is damaged. The same is true with emotions and all the rest of it. So, for now, let's just agree, for the sake of the conversation, that the mind is an emergent property of the brain. Well, every mind state, or brain state, in other words, is the cause of deterministic factors. What am I talking about? Well, guys, every single time you have a thought, if you're thinking right now this video is boring... If you're thinking right now this video is fascinating, if you're drifting off and thinking about what you're going to eat later or, or a problem that happened yesterday, whatever that thought is, whatever experience you're having in your mind right now, that experience is reducible to electrical signals in your brain. That thought or that experience, that mental state, is reducible to electrons firing, to neurons. It's reducible to brain chemistry and chemicals. All of these processes in your brain that make up each and every brain state are operating under the laws of physics, the laws of biology, right? And the laws of physics and the laws of biology and what have you operate deterministically. They never vary, they never change, and we certainly don't exert any control over them. So if my brain states and my thoughts and my feelings and my emotions are emerging as a consequence of an complicated ballet between the laws of physics and chemistry and what have you, then where's the freedom there? How can I say that any thought I've ever had was free when those thoughts are just a consequence of this interplay or this intricate ballet between brain chemistry and electrons and neurons firing and what have you? Where is the freedom there, guys? Now, if you're just going to say, oh, but I feel like I'm making free decisions. Well, guys, feelings are not a very good pathway to the truth. I mean, ask the flat earthers. I'm in agreement with them that it feels like I'm walking on a flat earth. The problem is the evidence doesn't support that. It feels absurd to me that people in Australia right now are standing the opposite way up to me. Oh, I just gave you an up yours by accident. <laughs> this was meant to be a little stick figure, just to be clear. So I'm standing here on the earth and all the way on the other side of the globe, there are other people standing here. And somebody's totally going to screen cap that, aren't they? <laughs> In any case, it seems absurd to me intuitively that there are people upside down relative to my position on the globe right now. And yet, the embarrassment of evidence forces me to believe that that is in fact true. And that's a very interesting point, by the way. People say that you can choose your beliefs. If you want another piece of evidence for determinism, that absolutely isn't the case at all. Nowhere is determinism more obvious than when it comes to beliefs. If I told you that there was something in my hand right now and then I open it to reveal that there isn't, 
You can't choose to continue to believe that there's something in my hand. You are hopelessly, deterministically caused to now lose that belief and believe the opposite, that my hand was in fact empty. Why? Because your eyes reveal that truth to you. You cannot choose to believe that which is impossible to believe. You see that my hand is empty right now, and so you are deterministically forced to believe that it is empty. And if you think beliefs are choices, why don't you choose right now to believe that my hand does in fact contain something? You can say the words, I believe Magic Skeptic has something in his hand, I believe Magic Skeptic has something in his hand, and yet you won't be able to compel yourself to believe it, because your eyes have already done the work for you. Your brain is hopelessly and deterministically convinced that my hand is in fact empty. But I digress. Each and every thought, each and every concern, each and every mental experience that you've ever had, guys, is reducible to brain chemistry, is reducible to electrons and neurons firing in your brain. I don't see any room for freedom in there. I don't see any room for age and causation in there. What I see is a very deterministic picture about our thoughts, feelings, emotions, hopes, worries, desires, etc., etc., etc. The second piece of evidence I have for determinism is a very interesting thought experiment, or what you might say, maybe perhaps you might call this a logical proof, albeit I do think it has some grounding in our experience. And let me talk you through it right now. To explain this, I need to very briefly tell you what a true dichotomy is. A true dichotomy is when there are only two options, right? There can only be A or not A. That's a very simple notation device for it. A or not A, or X or not X. I'll give you an example of a true dichotomy. So I have an apple. Let's imagine I have an apple here, right? Everything in the world is either an apple or not an apple. Again, that's a true dichotomy. There's no avoiding that. So every single object you find in the world will either be in the apple category or in the not apple category. Fair enough. Another good example of a true dichotomy is whether or not something is true or not true. So if we do a mathematical equation and the answer is 7, the answer is either 7 or it's not 7, right? It can't be anything else. Every single mathematical equation in the world abides by this true dichotomy. The answer is either 7 or it's not 7. So if the answer is 5, clearly it's in the not 7 category. If the answer is 6.9, almost 7, but it's not 7. So again, it's still in the not 7 category. Everything either has an answer of 7 or not 7. That's what a true dichotomy is. Please bear in mind that people will erect false dichotomies where they pretend or try to, they might not even be pretending, it might be a, a genuine mistake, but they will present two options as if they are the only options available, when in fact there are more. So if I said to take the math example, every equation either has the answer of 7 or 5, clearly there I've made a mistake because there are multiple answers, any number in all of the numbers that exist, which is an infinity of numbers, right? So that would be a false dichotomy. Going back to the apple analogy, if I said everything is either an apple or an orange, that's not true because I'm not an apple or an orange, am I? Although some of you might be tempted to call me one. <laughs> the point is you have to be very careful of false dichotomies. My favorite example is in the cosmological argument for God's existence. Theists or religious people will ask us to answer the following dichotomy. Again, a false one. They'll say either... God created the universe, or it came out of nothing. And they're asking us, they're inviting us and our intuition to reject the it came out of nothing option so that we're left with the only other option in their dichotomy, which is God did it. Of course, this is not a true dichotomy because the other option, at least one other option, and this isn't an exhaustive list, is that the universe has just always existed, that it, ex that it exists eternally. And anybody who wants to point out the, ridiculous the ridiculousness of that needs to immediately confront the ridiculousness of an infinitely existing God, which is violating the exact same intuition. But again, I digress. True dichotomies are very important to understand, guys, especially for the following proof of determinism. And it goes something like this. Everything you've ever done, every action you've ever committed, every supposed choice you've ever made in your life, you either did so because you wanted to or because you were forced to. That is a true dichotomy. And I invite you to challenge it in the comments below if you don't agree with me. But let me just explain briefly why it is. Again, everything you've ever done in your life, you've either, you've either done so because you wanted to or because you didn't want to, in which case didn't want to is a synonym for being forced 
to do something, right? So when I finish making this video, I'm going to go downstairs and have a cup of tea because I want to. So that's something I'm doing because I want to do it, right? If I was tied down by a torturer and they poured hot tea back my throat, again, forgive the ridiculous analogy here, that would be me drinking tea despite not wanting to because I'm being forced to. Now, I invite you to challenge this dichotomy. I can assure you that it is airtight. Some of the frequent challenges go something like this. But Magic Skeptic, I didn't want to go to the gym and I went anyway. So that's something I didn't want to do, and yet I still did of my own accord. Ah, but you're just hiding the actual want in there somewhere. It might be true that you don't want to go to the gym, but there's another desire, another want that resides in there that's winning out. Maybe that want is something to do with being physically fit, being healthy, looking sexy when your clothes are off, right? <laughs> there's lots of wants that are you know, petered throughout that particular scenario. And those wants are winning out over your lack of desire to get off your fat ass, right? <laughs> Please notice that on the days where the want to remain on your fat ass wins, those are the days that you don't go to the gym. Now, to be forced to go to the gym might look something like somebody putting a gun to your head, right? Or maybe you get very bad news from the doctor who says you're going to die if you don't get physically fit. Now you don't want to go to the gym, but you still go because you want to live, and that want is winning out over all of the others. Again, guys, this is a true dichotomy, which means it's inescapable. Every single action you have ever committed in your life, you've either done so because you wanted to or because you are forced to. Now, why do I bring up this true dichotomy? Why does this matter when it comes to determinism? Well, it's very simple, guys. Clearly, when you're forced to do something, there's no freedom there. If somebody holds a gun to my head and says, jump, or somebody holds a gun to my head and says, sing a song, my freedom there is compromised. Because I want to live, I'm obviously going to do what the person holding the gun has instructed me to do. I am robbed of my agency there. Another agent is imposing their will upon me. So evidently, I'm not free there. You might say I'm free to say screw you to the person holding the gun, but of course in doing so, I would be dying. I would be volunteering for death, which to call that a free choice, I think would be a bit unfair, to be quite honest. Even I, as a determinist, would say that. So evidently, when you're forced to do something, you're not free. Obviously, the gun to the head example is hyperbolic, but it serves to make the point. There's lots of ways in which we're forced to do things. And I'll allow you guys to come up with the examples in the comments below. Suffice to say, evidently, we're not free when we're forced to do something. So if there is any free will, for those of you who still believe in it, that has to reside in the want category, doesn't it? Because when we're forced to do things, we're evidently not free. The true dichotomy that I've described to you means that everything you've ever done in your life, you've either done because you wanted to or because you were forced to. If we're forced to, we're evidently not free. So if there is any freedom to be found, it has to reside when in the actions that we commit because we want to commit those actions. But therein resides the problem, guys. Therein lies the problem. We don't choose our wants either. Now, in case you're scratching your head wondering what I mean by that, well, let me clarify. Think of something you want right now. So, I'm thinking about that cup of tea I want. Right now, whatever it is you're thinking you want, the more fundamental to your being, the better. Let's imagine you're heterosexual and you're watching this video. Think of a person of the opposite gender that you're attracted to, somebody you want sexually right? If you're homosexual or bisexual or trans, whatever it is, whatever gender or particular variation of that that you're attracted to right now, think of an individual in the world that you are sexually attracted to, somebody that you, that you want, okay? I hope you all have somebody in mind. Choose not to want them. Do that right now. Tell yourself you don't want that person anymore and watch as you fail. You cannot unwant that which you want doesn't work that way. It is not an act of volition. You can say to yourself right now, I don't want them, I don't want them, I don't want them, I don't want them. But that doesn't change a thing. You still do. Your wants reside outside of your own will. Whether or not there is a will of your own is up for debate, of course. But even if there is a will and you're still holding on to that belief by a thread, why aren't you able to exert it in this moment? Why can't you abandon this want that you desire? 
Now, you can say, oh, because I don't want to, but that's a ridiculous statement. If you're believing, or if you're a believer in the idea that we can choose our wants, then surely you can just choose now to want to not want it, and then you can just reinitiate that a minute later just for this thought experiment. But you can't do it. You can't unwant that which you want. And similarly, you can't want that which you don't want. Because I'm going to ask you now to flip the script. Think of somebody who you find unattractive, somebody who you do not want sexually. And right now, choose to want them. And again, you will find it quite impossible. Now, perhaps some of you think that I've disingenuously kind of chosen the sexual domain for this conversation because maybe there is no freedom there. But just think of anything you want. Think of something as simple as a food type that you want. So I said I want that cup of tea. I can't choose not to want that. I really, really want it. No matter how many times I say it, I don't want tea, I don't want tea, I don't want tea. It doesn't become true. I still want it. Think of a food type that you don't like. I don't like coffee. Forgive me, coffee lovers, but I'm not a big fan. But again, don't forgive me because I didn't choose not to like coffee. Have you ever noticed that when people taste things, they're not actually choosing to want it or not want it they stick out their tongue and they dab whatever the object is on their tongue because they're checking to see if their body agrees with it they're not choosing whether or not they like it they're checking if their body is going to agree to like it and if their body rejects it they go oh no not for me and if their tongue does like it they go mm, yes i like that but there's no choice there there's no volitional state there now you might say oh but magic step skeptic aren't you choosing to taste it in the first place i would say that assuming you're not being forced going back to the true dichotomy you're tasting it because you wanted to taste it but you didn't choose that want you never chose any want ever in the history of your life if you could choose your wants, you would be able to unchoose them. And as we've just demonstrated with the sexual thought experiment and something as simple as whether or not you like coffee you cannot choose your wants. And everything you've ever done, you've done so either because you were forced to or because you wanted to. There's evidently no freedom in the force side of that dichotomy. Is there any freedom in the wants? Well, I think as I've just demonstrated with considerable clarity, there's no freedom there either. So guys, I'm sorry, but I'm not convinced there's any free will here. And again, if you have thought of a challenge that you want to pop in the comments below, if you want to call me out and you've seen the light where I've missed it, I'm the first person who wants to know. I don't issue that challenge with any hubris in mind. I would love to have my mind changed. I'm just not convinced that if my mind was in fact changed that it would be down to any degree or sense of freedom. Again, our minds being changed, to go back to the earlier point, is completely outside of our control. That's why we call them epiphanies. When you're sitting there and you realize, oh my God, I was wrong. Or, oh my God, I was right. That moment of realization is not a moment of your choosing. It happens to you. You are merely the witness in consciousness of this that is occurring as a mental state. And so, yeah, going on the laws of physics and embracing the true dichotomy as I've just described it. Again, I see absolutely no evidence for free will. But let me give you one last piece of evidence in case that wasn't enough. One last piece of evidence and then we'll move on. Just think about your day-to-day -day life, guys. Just think about your mental experiences as they occur from moment to moment. Have you ever chosen a thought to occur in your mind? Or do they just happen to you? Let me give you a couple of examples. Our own language betrays the truth. Have you ever used the phrase, pop into your mind? Have you ever been sitting there and then you feel like a thought pops into your head? Well, guys, I'm going to tell you right now that every thought that has ever occurred has occurred in the exact same fashion. You just may or may not have realized it. If I ask you right now to think of a movie, just pay attention to the psychological experience that occurs when I give you that command. Your brain goes from a state of not thinking about movies to one just emerging in consciousness. Now, were you aware of that film before you were aware of it? Obviously not. That would be paradoxical to say. So that means you can't have chosen it before you were aware of it. So your awareness of it was your first awareness of it. That sounds like a strange statement, but your awareness of it was the first moment where it was occurring to you. To say that you chose it would be to commit yourself to that paradox, that you chose it before it occurred. But that doesn't make any sense. What makes much more sense is the idea that 
the thought occurred and you were merely the witness of that thought occurring. And again, ask yourself, why did you think of the movie that you thought of? And whatever reason you give there will be the deterministic cause of the reason that movie occurred. Maybe it was a movie you watched recently. Maybe it's your favorite movie. So were you free to think of a movie that wasn't your favorite? Were you free to think of a movie that you hadn't seen recently and so forth? But now maybe that doesn't work for you. Maybe that example isn't persuasive. So let's do another one, right? So anytime you've ever been sitting on the couch or just walking around and going about your day-to-day -day business, a thought just occurs, you have an epiphany, you realize that you forgot something, for example. You go, oh no, I forgot to do that thing. But you didn't choose to remember that in that moment because you were thinking about something else. The thought just happens to you. And then when it happens, you have that adverse reaction. You go, oh no, right? Again, where's the freedom there? Let me give you another example. Have you ever had a song stuck in your head? What does it even mean to say a song has been stuck in your head all day, if indeed there's free will? Why can't you just unthink it? Ask yourself, why not? Why can't you unthink the song that's stuck in your head? Well, I think that's a very important question, and I think it reveals the truth of determinism. If our thoughts are free, if we're free to think about what we like, then why can't we unthink the song that's stuck in our head? Let me go one more, an even more serious example. Depression. What's that all about? Why can't depressed people just choose to be happy? I remember for the longest time I had a reoccurring thought about my fiance dying in various awful ways. I don't know why this got stuck in my head. I wasn't depressed. It was just a really, really bad thought that was stuck there and it kept reoccurring no matter how much I didn't want to think about it until it eventually relinquished me all by itself. I didn't feel like I had any agency in the matter. And guys, the same is true of any thought. It's like Carl Jung once said, and I'm aware that Carl Jung wasn't necessarily articulating a deterministic picture here, but he said something that bears massively on this conversation. He said that people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. And not a truer word was ever spoken within the context of determinism. You don't have ideas, guys. Ideas have you. If you've ever gotten a thought stuck in your head or a song stuck in your head or you're obsessing on something, you might say I, or in your case, you are obsessing upon something. But the I there doesn't really make sense. You could unthink it if there was free will, but that isn't the case unless you're defining free will differently. And that brings us to the meat of this conversation. Is it possible to say that we have free will if only we're willing to change the definition of what it means to say that we're free? So let's get into that right now. I speak, of course, about the philosophical position known as compatibilism. Compatibilism is the view that despite the truth of determinism, as I've articulated it, that we are still nonetheless free. Now, that might sound impossible to you if indeed you're a determinist such as myself, because if you're a determinist, you're evidently not a compatibilist. But compatibilists believe, and believe strongly, that determinism is true, and yet despite that truth, it's still appropriate to say that we are free. Why did they believe this? How did they justify this claim? They justify this claim with reference to a definition of free will that they believe is appropriate and absolutely necessary, right? In fact, compatibilists will argue that the determinist definition of free will is a magical, nonsensical one. So, just to be clear, my definition of free will as a determinist is the ability to do otherwise. So when I have that song that's stuck in my head, I should be able to unthink it. When I feel depressed, I should be able to unthink it. If I don't want to go to the gym, I should be able to will myself using my own age and causation to go to the gym, etc, etc. Now, obviously, I'm not convinced there's any evidence for being able to do any of that, which is why I call myself a, deter a determinist and which is why I don't believe there's any free will. A compatibilist, however, will argue that that understanding of free will is a nonsense one. It is a magical notion dreamt up by silly, silly philosophers such as myself. Now, obviously, in my view, the definition of free will as being able to do otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, preserves the meaning of the word freedom. But compatibilists disagree. 
They define freedom as acting in accordance with one's own internal desires. I'll say that again. They define freedom as acting, or free will, as acting in accordance with one's own internal desires. Let me give you an example to demonstrate what they mean by this. I'm going to sketch two options for you here. Option A is a person who donates to charity. They donate a thousand pounds to a charity of their choosing. They do this because they want to. They feel compelled to. They they care about this charity. They want to do the right thing. They have the disposable income in order to do it. And so they do it. That's option A. Option B is exactly the same with one essential difference. In option B, another agent, another person holds a gun to the head of the individual and says, donate a thousand pounds to a particular charity, which they then do because they don't want to die. That's option B. So the same end result, a thousand pounds is donated to a particular charity, but in option B, compulsion is involved. A gun to the head is involved. Now, a compatibilist will argue that these two options, option A and option B, tell us everything we need to know about whether or not there's free will and whether or not there's moral accountability or moral responsibility. You see, if you define freedom as acting in accordance with one's own internal desires, then the person in option A is evidently free. They had an internal desire or a want to donate to charity, and then they acted out that desire. In option B, the person's will is compromised by an external agent, an evil human being who holds a gun to their head and forces them to do something that they'd rather not do. But they do it in order to preserve their own life. The person in option B is evidently not free, right? Sounds good on the surface, totally fair. And, you know, to extend an olive branch to the compatibilist community, I understand why you feel how you feel, or at least I think I do. And if you're a compatibilist and you're watching this video, I'm about to explain why I think you guys find this position persuasive. And if I get it wrong, please jump into the comments below and highlight where I've gone wrong. Because if you can highlight where I've gone wrong here, you might change my mind and I could be a compatibilist tomorrow. But for now, I think the reason compatibilists find this persuasive is because at a subjective level, option A and option B obviously feel very different to the agent involved. If you're the person in option A who donates to charity of your own free will, then you evidently feel free. You feel like you did something of your own accord. You feel like you're an agent who did something. There was no compulsion involved. There was no external agent. Nobody put a gun to your head. You acted in accordance with your own desires. Totally fair. That feels very different from... A person holding a gun bursting into your home, holding that gun to your head and threatening to kill you unless you donate a thousand pounds. In fact, in option B, the agent who ultimately donates to charity out of fear for their life is probably going to end up with long-term PTSD. They're probably going to have to go to counselling and psychiatry and all the rest of it. They're going to be traumatised for life. Clearly, both options are radically different in terms of their consequences for the agent who donates the money to the charity. The consequences are going to be radically different for that agent because of their subjective feeling about what has happened. One of those situations, argues a compatibilist, or as, an, as a compatibilist would argue, is more free than the other one. You're evidently more free in option A. Now that all sounds wonderful, right? totally fair. Here's my deterministic response. While I accept and concede and acknowledge without question that at the level of subjectivity, both options could not be more different. They're radically diverse. In terms of the subjective experience of the agent involved, I agree entirely. There could not be more difference between option A and option B. But is there a difference in terms of freedom? Now, not perceived freedom, because I've already acknowledged that at the subjective level, one feels more free than the other. But is there an actual principled difference in the amount of freedom in both scenarios? I'm not convinced there is. Here's why. So if there is any freedom, the freedom is to be found in option A, right? 
Well, guys, option A is still reducible to those arguments for determinism that I laid out in the opening of the video. The person who donates to charity in option A, while feeling different to option B, still did so because of a brain state that is reducible to chemicals, chemistry, electrons, and neurons firing. In other words, where's the freedom there? Not the feeling of freedom. I'm aware. I'm going to keep saying I'm aware that they feel more free. But feeling more free doesn't mean that you are. Just like feeling like you're walking on a flat earth doesn't mean that you are. Feelings are irrelevant. What we're talking about is what's true. Not what feels true. What is actually epistemologically true. What is empirically true. And what is empirically true about, op about option A is that the agent in option A committed an action as a consequence of a brain state, a brain state which evidently contains no freedom. In other words, the agent acted according to a brain state over which they exert no control. Now, if you want to define freedom as acting in accordance with one's own desires, then sure, agent A is free. But the problem is one's own desires are not things that agent A has chosen. We don't choose our own desires, as I pointed out earlier in the video. Our desires happen to us. What we want is not choosable. Our wants simply are. We can't overrule them. We can't unwant them. We can't unwant something we want, and we can't want something we unwant. So if you're going to define freedom as acting in accordance with one's own desires, sure, you win a technical point with your definition. If I use that definition of the word freedom, then absolutely, Agent A is free. But the problem is, your definition of freedom contains things that the agent has no control over. Namely, one's own internal desires. We don't choose our internal desires. The agent who donates to charity didn't do so because they chose to do so. They did so because of their internal desires, which you can call a choice all you want, but those internal desires are reducible to brain states and chemistry that are deterministic and completely outside of your control. So where's the freedom in option A? And again, I grant that agent A is going to feel very different from agent B, but the feeling here is irrelevant. What matters is what's empirically true. And Agent A's brain state is reducible to deterministic laws of physics and chemistry. Where's the freedom there? But the problem runs even deeper than that. The compatibilist intuition here invites us to accept that Agent A is more free than Agent B. But that's not abundantly clear to me either. Not even according to your very own definition. If compatibilism is, def is defined as acting in accordance with one's own desires, isn't Agent B also acting in accordance with their own desires? The reason they donate to charity is because they desire to continue living. In option B, the agent has a gun to their head. And if they want to live, which is an internal desire that I think most agents have, unless there's something seriously wrong and there's a suicidality there, Agent B, or the agent in option B, is still acting in accordance with their own internal desires. It's just a different internal desire, the desire to continue living, which has emerged as a consequence of the external agent imposing their will upon agent B. Again, I'm not arguing here that agent B isn't compromised. I agree with that. I agree that at a subjective level, agent B feels compromised while agent A feels more free. I get that feeling. I understand that. I hope I never find myself in a position like Agent B in this hypothetical. That said, Agent B is still acting according to their internal desires. In this case, the desire to continue living. Right? And all because of an external agent imposing their will. But guys, that's another problem here. Why do compatibilists want to make a big deal out of internal and external causation? Because that's another thing that compatibilism fails to account for. I'll put the examples in the uh, description below. But there are two cases that come to mind. The names of the specific people have since blurred in my memory. But I will put the examples in the description below if you're interested in checking them out at any deeper level. But there's that example of the University Bell Tower shooter in the United States. I, th I think it was Charles Whitman was the name of the 
uh, shooter. But if I'm wrong there, I'll pop a clar- uh, correction on the screen. But this guy climbed a bell tower with a rifle and began shooting people and ultimately had a shootout with the police and was killed. After they killed him, they found a suicide note that said, please check my brain because I can't stop myself doing this. And they carried out his wishes and performed an autopsy and they found a tumour in his brain, in the part of the brain that controls aggression. So this shooter was internally motivated to commit an atrocity. But none of us, if we're being honest, would say that this person was free. How could you possibly say that this killer, that this shooter, acted according to their own free will? And yet, if we use the compatibilist definition, we have to say that this person was free, because they acted according to their own internal desires. Was the tumour not internal? Or is there a caveat that compatibilists have to add here in order to say, oh, the tumour is an external agent that happens to be living within? Well, that's just ridiculous. That is you having it all your own way. Clearly, determinism does a better job of accounting for the behaviour of this individual. They acted according to a tumour. They acted because their brain chemistry was compromised. Now, you might say, but Magic Skeptic, how does the determinist then differentiate between this shooter and someone who actually chose without the interference of a tumor in order to commit this act? I don't distinguish. I don't distinguish at all. Because even if this person climbed the bell tower according to a mere brain state that had nothing to do with the tumor, that brain state is still reducible to deterministic factors that are outside of our control. As Sam Harris once put it when discussing this exact example, it's actually brain tumours, metaphorically speaking, all the way down. It's just that if there isn't a brain tumour, the thing that causes our behaviour is something else that's equally outside of our control. You see, the brain tumour serves as an interesting example which gets people to agree with the idea that a person can commit an action for reasons other than their own volition. But as soon as they accept the brain tumour example, which is something that has compromised their will as an agent, then we're halfway towards getting someone to agreeing with determinism. Because the truth of determinism is that even without the brain tumour, if this person had climbed the bell tower as a consequence of electrons, neurons, and brain chemistry, and so on, well, that would be equally outside of the agent's control. In other words, there's no reason to single out the brain tumour here. But when when discussing compatibilism, compatibilism forces the person who's committed to it to create an arbitrary dis- an arbitrary distinction here that doesn't make any sense they're distinguishing between internal and external causation they want us to believe that when an agent imposes their will upon us that we're less free there than the person who climbed the bell tower but that doesn't make any sense at all because the brain tumor is arguably a more compelling reason for the action than the external agent holding a gun to your head because you could say if you to the person holding the gun to your head not donate the money to charity and accept the bullet you could actually do that if your desires were so inclined you could say f you to the person holding the gun and just accept death that is an option it's not clear to me that the university bell tower shooter did have that same option they were utterly compromised by the brain tumor right now some of you might say oh magic skeptic you've just unwittingly agreed to free will there by saying that you could say f*** you to the person holding the gun. Ah, but you could only do that if you wanted to, and you wouldn't have chosen that want either. Right? And here's just one other example. A very similar example, in fact. There was a very famous case of a man who, I'm afraid to say, and I hope I don't upset anybody here, but molested his own niece. It's a horrendous example, a horrendous crime. But it turns out that this guy committed this action because there was a tumour growing in the part of the brain that regulates sexual behaviour. And get this, when they performed an operation, opened his skull and removed the tumour, his paedophilic intentions went away. They went away. How does a compatibilist account for this? Did this man not operate according to his own internal desires? Did he not genuinely and sincerely want to carry out those sexual acts on his niece? Yes, he did. 
Why? Because of a tumour that had compromised his sexual behaviour. But it's still an internally motivated desire. So my challenge to you, compatibilists, is how do you account for this? How does one wrap all of this into your philosophical worldview? It's very easy for me as a determinist to do it. The tumour is just another deterministic cause of one's behaviour, just like an internal brain state or a particular set of neurons firing or electrons or brain chemistry. It's all determinism all the way down. I don't see a distinction between option A and option B. In option B, the most immediate proximal deterministic cause of donating to charity is an agent holding a gun to your head. In option A, the proximal deterministic cause of the action is a brain state that you equally exert no control over. Again, granted, those two situations feel different, but there's no freedom here. And defining option A as free complicates the picture, because if you're going to say that freedom is defined as acting in accordance with one's own desires, then you have to say that the university bell tower shooter was free. You have to say that the paedophile who was compromised by a brain tumor in, this, in the part of the brain that controls sexuality, you have to say that he was free as well. And ironically, despite the option A, option B dichotomy, you have to argue that option B is also free because even the agent in option B who is arguably compromised by the person holding the gun, they're still acting in accordance with their internal desire when they make the decision to donate to charity or not because they either desire to live or they don't. If they don't desire to live, their desire to say fuck you to the person holding the gun obviously wins out over their desire to survive. It's still all internal desire, right? And one last problem. One last problem and then I'll stop ranting. <laughs> if you define free will as acting in accordance with one's own internal desire, you run into another problem. Aren't all internal desires externalizable at one point when you go back along? So that is a relevant distinction between option A and option B. In option A, the proximal cause of the action is internal. It's an internal desire. The proximal cause in option B is an external agent, albeit the most proximal cause is still the internal desire to survive when the, that agent donates to charity. But look, that acknowledged. Aren't those desires externalizable in the fullness of time? So let's say I have the desire to go to the gym. That's my internal desire right now. And so then I go to the gym and I work out. The compatibilist wants to call that freedom because I acted in accordance with my own internal desire. Okay. But the reason I want to go to the gym has everything to do with the external. The reason I want to go to the gym might have to do with societal demands on my image which I have then internalized, proximally speaking, but they still began as an external motivator for that internal chain of causation. Maybe the reason I want to go to the gym is because I was raised by parents who encouraged fitness. Maybe the reason I want to go to the gym is because I want to impress the pretty girl, which again is an external factor, right? Aren't all internal desires externalizable? Because we are sensory creatures who operate according to the data we receive. So how does this definition of freedom make sense? Name any behavior. And I promise you, if you think about it deeply enough, you can find an external origin for it. If you want to just bring it back to basics, evolutionary theory. The reason we have certain desires, the reason I want to... Uh, have sex with uh, beautiful women as a heterosexual male is because of evolution. I've been primed and programmed, evolutionarily speaking, to find sex riveting, fascinating, desirable, which is again externalizable to the facts of evolution that have, uh, that have occurred over hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. It doesn't begin in the internal working of my brain. It's all externalizable. You could bring it all the way back to the Big Bang where this universe, or at least given our best current understanding, our local universe began. Right? So guys, talking about internal desires and using those as a definition for free will is very murky indeed. It works at best proximally. 
But even proximally, it doesn't work for all of the reasons that I have listed thus far. So I perceive an immense number of problems with this compatibilist definition of freedom. Defining free will as acting in accordance with one's own desires requires that compatibil compatibilists embrace examples of behavior that we would all agree are evidently not free. But more than that, their very own dichotomy between option A and option B breaks down because it's not clear to me that agent B isn't operating according to their own internal desires as well. And of course, lastly, aren't all internal desires externalizable, whether it be immediately with reference to an external agent imposing their will or ultimately whether or not we go back to how one was raised, the cultural circumstances and media influences that exert pressure upon an agent or even ultimately evolution and the laws of physics that led us to be the beings that we are right so guys i'm not convinced that the compatibilist definition of freedom stands up but sure if you just want to score a technical point and define freedom just assertively as acting in accordance with one's own desires then sure we're all free i just don't think that it's practical i just don't think that it works for all of the reasons that I've just laid out. So one final point then. Let's say for the sake of conversation, the compatibilist wants to define free will as the most proximal internal cause, right? The most proximal internal cause. That way they can say that the most proximal internal cause in option A is one's own brain state, therefore we're free. Whereas the most proximal cause in option b is an external agent and so if you want to define free will that way then there is in fact a relevant difference between option a and option b and i can't go down the road of externalizing the cause because that requires that we move away from the proximal or most immediate nature of the situation right fair enough let's limit it that way again there guys i would argue that the compatibilist runs into problems with the university bell tower shooter the pedophile example and so forth because even in those examples the most proximal immediate cause is something that we would all i hope evidently agree is unfree that being the tumor in the brain is it not fair to say that the most proximal cause of that shooter's actions was the tumor in the part of the brain that controls aggression? Is it not fair to say that the most proximal cause of the pedophile is the tumor in the part of the brain that regulates sexual behavior? Even then, the compatibilist has to bite the bullet on examples where I think, again, you'd have to be insane to allege our examples of freedom based on internal proximal causation. And again, that is the problem with defining free will as actions that are carried out according to one's own even proximal internal desires. And so, yeah, just one final thought on that. The fact is, guys, whether the proximal cause is internal, external, my desire, or another's will imposed, there doesn't appear to be any freedom unless you define freedom as deterministically acting according to your own unchosen desires but if you do you must say that the pedophile and the shooter were free also you even have to say that option b in this dichotomy that compatibilists often erect is free as well so in closing guys i want to deal with some objections and i've taken the liberty of writing these down so that i could do them with you one after another the first objection which I've already mentioned at the start of this conversation is that the determinist definition of freedom is a bad one. The determinist definition of free will, that is, being able to do otherwise, is in fact a bad definition. If you're going to say that's a bad definition, that's fine. I generally don't get into semantic debates, debates about what words mean, because the truth is, words can mean many things. Words don't have meanings, they have usages. I... I, I'm going to say this, I, I can't imagine a less enthralling debate. I can't imagine a more depressing, pointless and irrelevant debate than us right now debating about what a particular word means. I'm just going to give you my reason for the usage that I deploy. That's it. If you don't want to use this usage, that's fine. You use the compatibilist usage, albeit that usage runs into the problems that I've already described in this video. My definition of freedom, and it doesn't originate with me, of course, but my definition of freedom is that 
an agent has the ability to do otherwise. Now, obviously, I don't believe an agent has that ability. I think the agent will do exactly what they're going to do according to the laws of physics, according to the deterministic factors that lead to said behavior. And I don't think it's possible for an agent to, you know, thwart that. I don't think it's possible for an agent to unwant what they want or to want what they don't want and so on. We are just the end point in the chain of causation we are just the next domino that falls in the exact same way that when this domino falls this domino here has no choice but to fall with it i feel like that's how our actions are our actions will happen because of the things that preceded those actions and that's it right the ability to do otherwise is how i define freedom because i just in intuitively feel like that preserves the meaning of the word defining freedom as our own internal desires being acted out doesn't work for me at all because our own internal desires are evidently not free. We haven't chosen them and I won't reiterate that entire point here. So if freedom is to be defined as anything, surely, in my view at least, and intuitively speaking, it must be defined as the ability to go against that chain of causation. The ability for the agent to be the initiator of a chain of causation. Again, agent causation that really is my definition of freedom agent causation or the ability to do otherwise that's two different ways of thinking about it a student of mine in my philosophy class came up with a wonderful analogy which i'm going to share with you right now and it's the analogy of thomas the tank engine right thomas the tank engine sitting on the track right thomas the tank engine is a sentient train just like human beings are sentient. Thomas the Tank Engine is self-aware. Thomas the Tank Engine has thoughts and so forth. But Thomas is still on a track. And the track is going to go where the track is going to go. So for this analogy to work, it just has to be the case that Thomas's internal desires coalesce with the directionality of the track. Albeit every now and then when Thomas is diverted because somebody pulls a lever, which is outside of Thomas's control, that would be an analogy for when life forces us to do things that we'd rather not do. The person holding the gun to your head and what have you. But it doesn't matter whether or not Thomas is sentient and self-aware or what have you. Thomas still can't do anything other than follow the track. That's it. And that's kind of how I view life. It's just that our track is invisible. We can't see it. Now, does that mean that I believe the future is set? Not quite. Not quite. Guys, whatever you do, don't confuse determinism, which is the idea that there's no free will, with fatalism, which is the idea that the future is set in position. Now, you might say, but magic skeptic, if we're not free, doesn't that mean that the future is set? No, because randomness can still play a role. Maybe the future is not set. Maybe quantum randomness or quantum indeterminacy is true, and the future could be one of several. But even if the future has multiple options, that doesn't give us freedom. It doesn't mean that we are choosing from those options. We're just going to go wherever the deterministic causes lead us, right? That doesn't mean, however, that the future is set. Think of it like a rock rolling down a hill. Where the rock tumbling and tumbling and tumbling down the hill. And assuming that nothing hits the rock or moves the rock, we'll con continue to tumble at that velocity, right? Now let's imagine another rock bumps into us that changes our direction so now we're going on to a different path into the future let's imagine then the wind blows and that blows us in a different direction let's imagine the wind randomly blows because of quantum indeterminacy well again that would mean that the future is not set but you as the rock still aren't choosing where you go you're still entirely subject to the laws of physics you're not choosing anything and yet the future is still not set and so guys that's a very important distinction to be made here because determinists are often accused of fatalism and there is a distinction i am a determinist but i'm not sure yet whether or not i'm a fatalist i will be a fatalist if and when the quantum indeterminacy question is resolved if it is proven in the morning without question that quantum indeterminacy is a f absolute you know I was going to say something else there, but there's no need to swear. Let's imagine that quantum indeterminacy is invalidated. It's shown to be false. If that is the case, I will upgrade my position. I will cease to be a determinist and I will tell you in the morning that I'm a fatalist. But for now, while the jury is still out on quantum indeterminacy and whether or not the future is truly random, I'm going to continue to self-identify as a determinist. So I hope that gives you a sense as to why I define freedom that way and why I don't believe that the charge of compatibilists that i'm invoking some magical 
view of free will is i don't know i just i feel like it's it's an unfair charge i know what they mean i know what the compatibilist means when they say that it's a magical definition of free will what they mean is that it's not true and i agree the the definition of free will that i'm using is not true it's just the only definition of freedom that makes sense to me but look if the compatibilist wants to define freedom another way that's fine they're just going to have to bite the bullet on the myriad of examples that crop up that complicate their position that i've already elucidated upon in this video the other response to my position on determinism is that you know maybe the mind is non-physical and if it's non-physical then it's not subject to those physical laws now that is an interesting solution this is the you know dualist response maybe the mind is non-physical maybe the mind floats somewhere above the brain or maybe it is in fact in the head somewhere but it's just a non-physical kind of non-corporal substance a non-physical substance a la substance dualism and if that is the case then yeah sure that mind could in fact escape the deterministic laws of physics but prove that there's a non-physical mind please i'm not convinced there's any evidence for a non-physical mind the mind appears to be what the brain does and if it's non-physical it's not clear to me how we how we would ever even demonstrate that it exists we couldn't measure weigh, taste smell it we couldn't interact with it at all you see guys that's the problem with articulating non-physical or metaphysical solutions to things there's no mechanism for determining the existence of the metaphysical and there being no mechanism doesn't mean that it's any more likely that that non-physical thing exists. You still have to demonstrate it or else you're irrational by definition for believing in it. So go ahead, be my guest, assert that there's a non-physical mind. It just doesn't get us anywhere. I agree with you that if indeed the mind is non-physical, then we could in fact escape the laws of determinism and the laws of physics and chemistry and all the rest of it. That's a possibility if you could demonstrate that there's a non-physical mind or a soul substance but nobody has ever demonstrated that now some of you are going to say oh but magic skeptic that's unreasonable you can't ask us to demonstrate the existence of something non-physical fair enough and i'm not asking you to just don't ask me to believe in it without a demonstration and your insistence on believing in it without a demonstration just reveals your irrationality and you know what that's fine you do you i just have a higher epistemological bear I'm not going to believe something until it's demonstrated. You can't just assert that it's true and when asked for evidence say it's unreasonable to ask for evidence. Well, I'm sorry, but you have to put on your big boy or big girl boots to have conversations like these and you better bring your evidence or else you're going to be laughed out of the room. So sure, if a non-physical mind or soul substance could be demonstrated to exist, you might have actually proven the existence of libertarian free will. But until then, don't waste my time. The final objection I want to deal with is that of moral responsibility. But before I address this issue, I want to make you aware that this isn't actually an argument against my position. It's not a factual argument that seeks to undermine the facts of, as I've presented them or the nature of reality as I've presented it. It's more an articulation about discomfort with the facts as I've presented them. And it goes something like this. Magic skeptic, if indeed there isn't any free will, if there's no freedom, then doesn't our whole justice system come tumbling down? How can we possibly blame criminals for their actions and lock them up and punish them? Doesn't the whole artifice of our justice system come tumbling down in a deterministic reality? And no, I don't believe so. But again, remember, this isn't an argument against determinism. It's an argument about the practicality of incorporating determinism into our actual day-to-day -day lives, and more specifically, the justice system. I don't think this is a problem at all for our justice system. In fact, I think a deterministic ethic would improve our justice system. In a deterministic world, in a perfect world where everybody accepted the truth of determinism, given the facts as I've presented them, we would just be punishing people for a different reason. We wouldn't be punishing them because they're morally responsible. We would be punishing them in the hopes that that domino, i.e. the punishment, reorients the behavior of the individual. Just like that rock rolling down the hill, the rock rolling down the hill is rolling in a criminal manner. Maybe the punishment is the gust of wind that reorients the rock and blows it in another direction, a law-abiding direction. So again, the agent can be completely unfree, completely deterministically motivated in every moment, and yet have their behavior changed by another deterministic factor, i.e. a punishment. So punishment makes perfect sense in a deterministic model. In fact, 
I would argue that punishment is deterministic from the word go. Even in our so-called libertarian society, where most people assume free will, what they're hoping is that the punishment conditions the criminals such that they don't behave in that criminal fashion any longer. That is commensurate with the truth of determinism. In fact, you're imposing a deterministic system upon that criminal in the hope of reconditioning them. That is what conditioning is, right? It's a deterministic factor that reorients behavior. So I think we've been acting according to the truth of determinism all along. Why do I say it would improve our justice system? Because we'd lose all of the unhelpful crap where we vilify people, where we call them scumbags and think that we're superior to them. In a deterministic reality, which is the one we live in, I'm afraid to say, but in a deterministically modeled justice system, we will be punishing people in the hopes that our punishment would reorient them just like a domino. But we wouldn't be engaging in any value judgments. There would just be the mere acknowledgement that this criminal, criminal A, embodies the problem. And because they embody that problem, it's necessary to reorient them. Think of it like a broken machine. If a machine is broken, it needs to be fixed so that it functions correctly. In a deterministic justice system, the punishment of criminals would be a lot like that, by way of analogy. We would just be acknowledging that the human is broken and that they need to be fixed. And we would hope that the punishment we put in place is enough to deterministically reorient that agent's behavior. And in the event that it doesn't reorient that agent's behavior, we just keep them locked up out of practicality. Because we can't live in a society where criminals like rapists, murderers, and thieves can go around and commit their acts with impunity. You see, guys, there's nothing about determinism that invalidates the justice system. We would just have to think about it a little bit differently. But other than that, it would function in exactly the same way. So in closing, guys, I want to share an analogy with you that I find to be incredibly useful for understanding the difference between determinism and compatibilism, and why I believe that determinism is in fact the best philosophical position to hold on this question. I speak, of course, about John Locke's analogy of the man in the locked room, and it goes something like this. The man wakes up in a locked room. Of course, he doesn't realize that it's locked. He's been asleep for quite some time, and he wakes up in this room. Upon waking up, he sees the door, but he doesn't check it. He decides, according to his own internal desires, that he wants to stay in the room. The question is, is he free? Now, I believe that he's not free. He has acted in accordance with his own internal desires, that is, the desire to remain in the room. But I would argue that he's still not free, because if in the event that he were to, quote, choose to leave the room, he would be unable to, because the door is locked. It is merely incidentally the case that he wants to remain in the room which is the only option option available to him. Again, it's a lot like Thomas the Tank Engine on that track. The track is going to Birmingham, and it just so happens that Thomas wants to go that direction too. Is Thomas free? I don't think so, because Thomas can't choose to divert and go to another location. The compatibilist, looking at this exact same analogy, because of their definition of freedom, must bite the bullet here and say that the man in the locked room, who just so happens wants to stay, is in fact free because he's acting according to his own internal desire. This, my friends, I believe to be asinine because given the hypothetical as it is articulated, it is abundantly clear that the man in the locked room evidently cannot leave and it is irrelevant, absolutely irrelevant, that this man's internal desires happen to coincide with his unfree circumstance. That is entirely irrelevant. And if you disagree there, then you're a compatibilist. If you disagree there, you are a compatibilist. I believe strongly, and I hope that I've done something for your understanding here, and I hope that I've done a good enough job to explain why I believe this, but I believe strongly that the man in the locked room analogy is best accounted for with the truth of determinism. He is evidently not free his internal desires are irrelevant here because the truth is there's only one option available to him and that's it. And to define freedom such that he's still free despite the fact that he can't leave is just a nonsense to me. And on that note, guys, I hope that you used your deterministic will 
<laughs> I hope, even if you're a compatibilist, that your internal desires were such that you remained here until the end of this video. And I hope above all else that you at least learned something. If indeed you found this video persuasive and I've changed your mind, I would absolutely love to hear from you in the comments below. But if you still disagree and you feel that I've missed something important and you know, you're still a compatibilist or maybe perhaps even still a libertarian and you believe fully in free will, give me your reasons in the comments below. And you know, I'm all for changing my mind. If you have found evidence for free will or for compatibilism that is persuasive that I've missed out on or what have you. I, I really want to know about it, guys. So jump into the comments below and let me know. Jump into the comments below even if you just agree with me. I would love to know that we're on the same page and we can discuss the reasons why. Um, and that would be wonderful. As I've said before and I'll say it again, one of the best things about this channel, and I never anticipated this, but one of the best things about this channel is interacting with you guys. The conversation often flows on for weeks after the original upload in that comment section below. And I would love for you to join in in that conversation. Other than that, if this was your first visit to the channel, please do consider hitting that subscribe button. And if you do, don't forget to check the bell notification icon. That way you'll be able to stay up to date with all things on the channel. And you'll even be notified as and when my latest videos go live. So guys, thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked it, please do drop a like. That would be enormously appreciated. And other than that, I hope to see you in the next one. And all the best. Bye-bye.